Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Um, today is Friday, August 11th, 2023, so that's when this episode aired. Um, all of our episodes are generally live. Some of them are pre-recorded, but uh, after the live airing of these episodes, they are saved, so you can go back and look and uh, check out any of the past episodes that we've done if you need to go back and learn some something or you want to rewatch whatever you want all these episodes are saved uh, if you like what you see here please go ahead and subscribe leave a like on a video lets us know we're doing a good job and that we should keep doing it and if you want to support the channel we definitely appreciate it you can always go to skywatcher.threadless.com and pick up some cool swag uh, for skywatcher products um, or just to have something kind of cool, uh, that's over at the skywatcher.threadless.com. And then, of course, we also have a podcast. So wherever you get your podcasts, whether it's you know Apple Podcasts or anything similar, uh, all of our episodes have been converted to podcast episodes as well if you just want to listen on how things uh, go on episodes. So all those are available, and the new episodes slowly do get converted over to podcasts as well. But you can get all of that from wherever you get your podcasts from. And uh, we are in August now, so the new Totem Target, which is the Seahorse Nebula, is up. I hope you guys are getting some good data on that. Uh, those of you who participated in last month's uh, Totem, we will be getting your patches out here shortly, probably after we get back from Starfest. Um, so you probably see your patches at the end of the month. There wasn't too many this month, but you will be getting your patches uh, for that. So just be patient. We'll get those out. All right, so today we're actually talking about uh, visual astronomy. We get a lot of requests to do more visual episodes. I know astrophotography is a very dominant part of the hobby, uh, but uh, we do need to look at visual as well. And today we're going to be talking about picking a refractor uh, for visual. Some of the information that's going to be in here is probably overview uh, for all of you here. But if you're new and you're just looking to pick something, uh, we're going to learn about the major types of refractors and then jump into what they're good at. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, so let's just talk about the general types of refractors. And the most commonly available one right now is achromatic refractors. And what we be by achromatic or acro um, is what we call them for short. An achromatic refractor um, is a refractor that generally has two pieces of glass composing the front objective of the telescope. And when you think of a telescope, you're probably thinking of a refractor for the most part, especially if you're new to astronomy. So what happens is the light comes in from the front and then is focused uh, to the focus point. Um, but that's how a refractor generally works. Now, the thing about achromatic refractors is they don't focus all three of the major colors to one point. You have green, red, and blue, um, which is what we normally focus on as far as colors. And the issue with achromatic refractors is the blue generally comes to focus at a different point than the other two colors. Now, like I said before, these refractors are generally composed of two elements in the front. Uh, there's no exotic glass used, um, which we'll talk about in the apochromatics that are coming up next. There's nothing really high end about the lenses or the glass that is generally used in these refractors. And because they don't focus all the colors to the same point, you get what's called blue fringing or better known as chromatic aberration. Uh, this is where not all the colors are focused to the same uh, point as the other colors. So you get this purple or blue fringing around it. Now, these telescopes are generally good for visual work. They're common with beginners uh, because these refractors are normally fairly affordable, especially for their size in comparison. Uh, and if you want to know what chromatic aberration looks like, this is chromatic aberration. You see all the stars in there have a, all these blue fringes on them. And chromatic aberration is going to happen on an achromat refractor on bright objects. Uh, so the moon, the planets... Um, all stuff like that. Uh, on a bright target, you're going to see that color fringing occur. And this happens in camera lenses as well. The more uh, budget-friendly lenses 
uh, generally don't use the exotic uh, ED or extra low dispersion glass or fluoride or the really pricey high-end glass that is used to correct for this color aberration. Some of these telescopes just don't use that because if you use these more uh, advanced glasses, it costs a lot more money. So an achromatic refractor is going to have that purple fringing. Now, there's different ways to counteract this and also ways that this can be worse. Uh, the first one is focal length is going to be a very big player when it comes to achromatic or chromatic aberration. So the shorter the focal length, the more severe that chromatic aberration is going to be uh, because that light is getting focused at a much steeper cone uh, than a longer focal length. And you can see from this example right here, the shorter focal length, uh, the blue is fairly far from the focus point for the other colors. And this is very common in like those more cost-effective short tube refractors that are out there. You see them in all different sizes, but you know, these, these short focal length achromatic refractors and they are effective telescopes, but you need to use them in the correct way. And they do have a purpose for them. And I'll talk about that in a little bit uh, of detail a little bit later. But there is a reason why these short focal length acromats exist. And then we'll go check out why. Now, if you have an achromatic refractor that's longer, so for example, a short focal length uh, acromat would probably be like F5, or f6.5 those are two very common f ratios that are on the market today uh, like our star travel uh, 80 or star travel 102 or our 120 um, star travel those are short tube achromatic refractors um, another example would be like the explore scientific ar series the 102 the 127 and the 152 that they have all these telescopes are fairly fast optics for a ch achromatic refractor so they're going to have chromatic aberrations on them but there's a reason why they exist so in order to correct that we go with a longer focal length so longer focal lengths are going to help reduce how steep those light cones are which allows the colors to be focused better and provides a cleaner overall image now you know, there's like a really popular one that's on the market is uh, like the Celestron uh, 150 F8 um, achromatic refractor. I know Skywatcher makes our own variant of it. We just don't sell it here in the States. Um, but it's a six inch F8 achromat. Now there are other ones like the 120 F8.3 achromat. These telescopes are very nice. They're still achromats, but they're very nice. They do have some color but they're better corrected than a faster optic. Now, there's a balance between the aperture of the refractor and the focal length. So, like, there's a Star Travel 150. It's a 150 millimeter F5 Acromat. I actually have one. It's a very impressive telescope. It's a stubby little thing. It's a 6-inch F5 refractor, and it's an Acromat. And there's a lot of color aberration on that telescope when you're using it for bright objects. Just don't use it for bright objects. It's a deep sky wide field telescope. It's like a super finder almost. And if you use it for that, that's what they're good for. Um, if you're into planets, that's going to be a whole other thing. Now, there are other companies that have long focal length uh, acromats. Uh, D&G uh, was probably one of the most well-known manufacturers i don't think they're producing telescopes anymore which is unfortunate because they're very nice telescopes but they're big um they make like f12 f15 these long focus old school style achromatic refractors and you could get them in crazy apertures like six inch eight inch 10 inch the largest one they ever made is a 15 inch which is currently at the three rivers foundation in texas I think it's a 15 inch f12 i think is what it is it's huge um but unfortunately those long focus acromat refractors they don't sell very well um, if you're doing it from a telescope company so you don't see them very often anymore 
And with the price of ED glass becoming more and more affordable, it makes more uh, makes it a better uh, route for companies like ourselves to go with apochromatic refractors because they are becoming more cost effective. Where and there's becoming less and less advantage of selling an acromat when an apochromat or an apo is becoming much easier to produce. So you're seeing more of these apochromat refractors, uh, apochromatic uh, refractors coming out. Now there's variations of them. I'll give you the two big ones. The first one is the ED doublet apochromatic refractor. Now, here's an example of that. Uh, so just like the acromat that we talked about earlier, this is a this is also what's called a doublet. A doublet refers to two pieces of glass making up the objective lens of the telescope. Except on this particular doublet, an apochromatic doublet as opposed to an acrochromatic doublet, the also known as an ED or extra load dispersion doublet, the one of the elements is made of a very high quality extra low dispersion glass element. Now there's a bunch of those out there. There's FPL 51, there's FPL 53, there's FPL 55, FCD1, FCD100. Uh, there's a monster list of these types. Uh, and then fluorite is obviously considered the best, um, but it's also very brittle and difficult to work with. So there's a lot of different... Uh, doublet designs out there we have our evo star ed series here at skywatcher which is the evo guide 50 the evo star 72 80 100 120 and the 150 those are all ed doublets uh, takahashi has had their fs series for a long time which are fluorite doublet refractors um, and then there's a bunch of other manufacturers out there making ed doublet refractors now, if you were to take the lens out of one, you would see there are two pieces of glass in there. There's the front crown element, and then there's the rear element. A lot of these uh, telescopes use ED glass on the rear side to keep it safer and uh, not get damaged by cleaning and stuff like that. So a lot of times in these designs, the, the higher end ED or fluorite element, depending on the manufacturer, is on the rear side where the front side is just the basic crown element, which is just standard optical glass. Now, the advantage of these is, A, it's composed of two elements, so it's a lot easier to produce. Um, generally uses one element of extra low dispersion glass. And that extra element using that higher end glass is going to give you a more color-free image where you're not going to have as much or you're going to eliminate chromatic aberration at least from a visual perspective i've done right an ed doublet can be a very effective imaging instrument as well um, but we're talking about visual now just like a chromat acro refractor the focal length is a big deal on an ed doublet so because you're only using two pieces of glass i like to call them degrees of freedom is what i call them um, you have the front element and the back element. So you have two degrees of freedom to work with. Um, so it becomes very difficult to produce a very color-free ED doublet in a large aperture and still be color-free because there's a balance between how long the focal length is and how big the aperture actually is. So we could make a 120 F5 ED doublet, but it would be difficult to maintain a fully color-free image. Um, usually you need to go to the next line up, which is the triplets, and we'll get to that as well. But the nice thing about a doublet acromat, it, apochromat is they're easy to produce. Um, collimation on these is very simple because you just have two spherical uh, lenses, so they work well with each other. And you're only using one piece of ED glass, or at least you're only using two elements. So you're only having to figure two lenses as opposed to more. Um, so these are very good telescopes for visual work and for intro astrophotography, as long as you're kind of aware that you might get a little color in your image. But 
for visual and eat a nice ed doublet is fairly well corrected you're not going to get the color fringing because the only way you could get around color fringing on an acromat is to either accept that that color is going to be there uh, b stop down the aperture to make the focal length the focal ratio longer so a lot of times like those six inch f8 uh, doublets like celestron has they come with a stop down aperture mass to take it from six inch to four inch well that's all well and good because it takes you to like f12 or something like that um but then you just took your six inch telescope and you stopped it down to four inches so what was the point of you buying that big cool refractor if you're going to just stop it down to a four inch you could have just spent money on a four inch and saved some money um or you can use a uh, chromatic aberration filter which filters out the blue but it turns the whole view a very yellow tint so there's ways around it but it is not nearly as effective as going with an apochromat so an ed doublet is you're just dipping your toe into the apochromatic world they're fairly affordable for their sizes because they're only using two pieces of glass in comparison to the more advanced uh, designs now again here's that thing the focal length of this is going to help with the correction so the a slightly longer focal length it can be shorter but like most of our doublets are around f 7.5 so they're a little faster than their achromatic counterparts but because they have that rear ed element that helps with the correction so we can make it slightly faster which makes it a little bit shorter so a little bit lighter weight uh, not as long of a telescope on the mount, so you don't have so much moment arm that the mount has to throw around. Um, and they cool really quickly because you only have two pieces of glass and one air gap. Uh, so they can reach ambient temperature really well. If you're doing solar imaging, the ED doublets are fantastic because that's all you need. Even an acromat for solar is more than you need because you're only working with one color if you're doing narrow band. Um, but the longer focal length paired with that ED element is going to provide improved color correction and become vastly superior visually over just to say a basic app or basic acromat. Now, of course, the big one is the ED triplets. Now, an ED triplet is exactly that. It uses three elements of glass or three degrees of freedom is what I call call this one because you have three different elements to work with. Now, there's a lot of talk out there about, oh, this telescope doesn't use FPL 53, or oh, this one doesn't use that. It really doesn't matter what glass you actually use as the ED element, because you can't just throw ED glass into a design and suddenly it's a color-free image. These lenses have to be optically matched to each other to make sure that the corrections work with each other. So you can't just throw two basic pairs of glass with some random ED element. You need to pay attention to how they mesh together. A telescope only works when all of the optics have been matched up to provide that color correction that you're looking for. Because there's a lot of people that are like, oh, why don't you just use three FPL 53 elements? Because it's ridiculous and expensive to make it. Um, and it doesn't need it. A triplet with one FPL 53 element designed right is more than enough. Now, there are other telescopes on the market that are using two ED elements, uh, like the Takahashi TOA, one, uh, TOA 130 and 150s. They use two ED element refractors, and for their design, that works. But you pay for that, and what you're actually getting from that I don't know. I mean, Takahashi's are fantastic. I've seen a few of the TOA 130s and the 150s, and they're built like a tank, and they're amazing optically. But what those two ED elements gives you over, say, another brand's standard ED triplet design, I, I don't know that you'd really be gaining much. But uh, then you have other companies like Tech that use fluorite, which is phenomenal but it's very difficult to work with and uh, yuri over at tech does an amazing job fabricating those refractors but the fluoride is expensive and he knows how to work with it but a lot of times you can get away with just one ed glass element 
Now there are certain ED glasses that provide better color correction um, when matched correctly. And it just depends on what's being done. You can still make decent stuff out of like FPL 51 or FCD one. And as long as it's matched well, it does pretty good. Um, but a lot of people get hung up on the glass type inside the refractor. That's like asking what your engine is made up of in your car. There's a lot more that goes into that than just, oh, my engine block is made out of steel. Okay, what else? That's the same thing as a refractor. What's the ED element? Oh, it's FPL 53. Okay, what else? It's You can't just distinguish a refractor and its quality from what glass it, it uses. And the problem if you get hung up with this ED glass element, because a lot of people have been told that FPL 53 is the best. And it's up there. It's fantastic. But there's new glass that comes out all the time and people don't know about it. So they get hung up on this old glass and because they want manufacturers to stick with what they know, it makes moving forward very difficult when there's something new that comes out like FCD 100 or FPL 55 or whatever these companies are gonna come out with. There are new glass types that are constantly coming out that are either equal or superior. And if you don't make a refractor out of that, then people freak out because it's not what they know, but there's always new stuff coming out and manufacturers are always looking for better ways to produce better quality, larger aperture telescopes at an affordable price. So one thing I'd like to say on this is, um, for example, for those of you hooked on FPL 53, FPL 53 can only be poured to about 180 millimeters in diameter. So you can get about a six or six and a half inch telescope lens out of that glass plate. Now, you also want to, the problem with that is if we want to make anything bigger than six inch, like what if we wanted to make a seven inch or what if we wanted to make an eight inch refractor? We couldn't do it. You'd have to have them pour a custom pour, which is ungodly expensive. Or you start looking at other glass types. Like for example, FPL 55 can be poured up to 15 or 16 inches in aperture or in diameter. You could make more six inch refractors out of that pour because it's 15 inches wide or you could make bigger lenses. So just an example that there's a lot of good options out there that are continuing to come out. So you can't be stuck on glass type when you're buying a refractor. Just because it says this or that doesn't mean it's everything. You have to look at the whole package. But anyway, that's my little glass rant. So back to triplets really quick. Uh, these are composed of three elements in the objective. Usually uses one or more ED glass elements. Again, like the doublet design, the, the ED elements are normally housed in the middle or the last two. Usually you don't put the expensive glass on the front crown element just to keep it safe. Um, this helps color correction quite a bit and that's why triplets can be made faster like the Esprit uh, 100 which is f5.5 you now have a four inch f5.5 refractor that's very well color corrected because it's a triplet the triplet allows you to have more freedom when you're designing because you have more elements you can get away with shorter focal lengths, which is makes it more compact while still being co well color corrected and they're good for visual and astrophotography. So with all that, which one? Well, that's a big topic because what are your deciding factors? What is the application that you're buying your telescope for? And that's where you really wanna ask yourself the question of what am I buying this telescope for. What are my goals of owning this telescope? Is it deep sky? Is it wide field? Is it planets? Is it all of it? And knowing that and what each design brings to the table can kind of help you figure out which instrument's going to be best suited to help you reach your desired goal. So again, what is your desired application? Is it deep sky? If it's deep sky, Deep Sky 
means we're generally looking at lower powers of magnification. You're looking at a wider chunk of sky and you're not zooming in as much. So really when it comes to deep sky, just like if you're looking at Dobsonian's aperture rules, you wanna collect as much light as possible in order to be able to see as faint as you can. And the nice thing about deep sky is you can really use any refractor for it because we're not asking a lot from the optics. We're generally keeping it the magnification low. Um, we're not zooming in too much. We're not really looking at bright things. So all three designs work very well for this uh, uh, application. If you're looking to do deep sky, I would probably select the largest aperture that you can afford. Now, I would also recommend that you pay attention to the mount because the bigger the refractor is, the longer it is and the heavier duty of a mount that you need. The telescope in the field here and the picture there is a 7-inch F9 ED doublet. It was an awesome telescope, and, but because of how big it was and the fact that it was about 40 pounds, and nearly six feet long, I needed to put that on my Paramount MX to use it because of the moment arm. So if you're starting to get these big, like our Evo Star 150 DX, you're gonna need to put that on like an EQ6R. That's something you need to consider when you're getting these larger refractors is you need a mount that's going to comp complement that, which is also ultimately going to lead to having to pay attention to your budget. Uh, but ultimately, Figure out what you want for deep sky. If you want to use a refractor, refractors for deep sky are awesome because of the contrast. They're generally well baffled. They have very high contrast and stuff just looks sharp. Stars are needle points in these refractors of any size. Um, so a basic little acromat would work. A doublet would be fine. A triplet would be fine. All of that is good uh, for deep sky. Just really get the biggest one you can afford but also make sure that you have a mount that can support it and you're willing to set it up because if it's too big to where you don't want to take it out then you wasted your money so just keep that in mind next is wide field now wide field could go right under deep sky but wide field is a little bit different because wide field you generally i would say anything under a thousand millimeter focal length is good uh, now, like our star travels, they're all F5s. So the 80 is 400, the 102 is 500, the 120 is 600. And if you can track down a 150 F5, um, the nice thing about these is they take a big chunk of the sky, you know, two or three degrees or more, um, and just let you pan through the Milky Way. Now, the reason I like these short tube refractors, and this is why I have a six inch F5 refractor, it sucks on the moon. I mean, the moon looks nice, but it's bright and it's got a big blue halo around it. It's basically a kaleidoscope is what it is. But for deep sky, putting a very low power, like a 30 or 40 millimeter, where you get three or four degree field of view, you get ultra tight little stars you get really high contrast so for nebulas and you're getting a wide field of view and best of all because you could do all of this with a newtonian but best of all you don't need to get a coma corrector like you would on a short newtonian and you don't need to collimate them you just pop them on the mount and you're ready to go so a refractor a little short refractor is a really nice telescope to take out for observing deep sky now you don't need fancy optics if you're doing wide field work because you're not requesting a lot from the optic. It just needs to focus light. And a lot of times you're going to be using low power eyepieces so the magnification is kept pretty low and you're not magnifying on bright objects where you're going to get chromatic aberration. So a short tube acromat like our Star Travels or like Explore Scientific's AR series all of those are fantastic for wide field uh, because you're just taking in a big old chunk of the sky. Now you can do the same thing with an ED apochromat refractor like a doublet or a triplet, but you end up spending a lot more money for no major gain um, on that uh, because the ED doublets are gonna be there for color correction, so are the triplets. Um, they do fantastic work with low power. The stars, you'll find 
that you probably won't see a lot of difference between an acromat and an apochromat when you're using it for deep sky or wide field work. You're just not going to see it because you're not, you won't see it much. Um, the difference will be a lot harder to split uh, between those various designs because you're just not requesting a lot from the optics. Planets, and I'll throw lunar under there as well. Planets are generally something that when you think of a refractor, a lot of people think you're into planets because of the contrast. And that's refractors are very good uh, for planetary work. Now, planets require generally high power, and you're zooming in quite a bit to see it. Now, this is where the argument stops. So if you're doing planetary work with an acromat, it's probably best if you're shooting for something a little bit longer focal length, A, because you want to get the image scale up. So you probably want like 800 or more millimeters of focal length so you can magnify the planet enough. But even with the larger acromats like the Celestron uh, C6R, which is the six inch F8, I've owned two or three of those. They're fantastic refractors. I've had one of the best views of Mars I've ever seen in one of them, but it had a bunch of color on it. So, and that purple fringing, it's not super annoying, but the more critical you become when you observe a lot and you're looking for those fine details under high power, that chromatic aberration really becomes annoying because it's distracting. Your eye tends to go off and look at the glare rather than the little details that you're seeing. So I'm not a big fan of the acromats at this point um, for planetary work because it just becomes annoying. Unless you have a long focal length uh, that really corrects it really well or you stop it down. But then you're losing your resolution. So that's where the apochromats are going to come into play. A really nice ED doublet is going to solve all that problem for not a whole heck of a lot of extra money. You do have the ED triplets. Uh, the triplets, you're going to be spending a lot more money on them. Like, for example, our Esprit 150 is $8,000 as it currently sits here in the U.S. and Canada. And our Evo Star 150, which is our doublet, is like $4,100. So it's half the price and I've had both of them side by side. And if you're just using that for visual, the Evo star is more than enough refractor uh, to do that. Now the Esprits and other triplets are phenomenal. They're really well corrected and they'll do everything that you want it to do, but it's a lot of extra money. And if you're just approaching this from a visual aspect, it's probably more than you need to spend. Um, so if you're doing planetary, apochromats are going to be probably my recommendation for this. This also goes for lunar, um, because they're just going to provide a very clean, uh, image. Now, what if I just want something that does everything? Now, this is a reason I'm a big fan of refractors and I have a few of them other than my big 28 inch daub. Everything beyond my daub is a refractor as it currently sits. Um, the reason I like refractors, and if I honestly had to pick one telescope, it would probably be a six inch refractor, six inch APO refractor. And here's why a six inch refractor is large enough to make deep sky interesting. An apochromatic six inch refractor also allows you to do really nice planetary work. If you want to do astrophotography, a refractor is very easy to retrofit for imaging purposes. So you could put a camera on the back of it or whatever you need to do. And for me, if you like doing solar observing, you can also easily pair the appropriate solar filters onto a refractor. So a refractor I find to be the most versatile uh, telescope design out there. It's really the master of everything. The only limitation with these is it's really difficult to make them bigger than six inch and they are not cost effective when you get over that six inch aperture. But a decent six inch refractor is gonna keep you busy for a very long time. You could easily go your entire life and not observe everything that a six inch refractor or something similar in size like a five inch could show you. So for me, 
I've owned a ton of different telescopes and what I really enjoy about the refractor design is it's a very multi-role instrument. You can do all kinds of stuff with a nice refractor. Um, so I think they're the most versatile design possible out there. So if you're looking for a one and done, I would probably aim for that five or six inch refractor. You can do anything you want. Deep sky, planetary, wide field, imaging, solar, all of it can be done with a really nice five to six inch refractor or whatever fits your budget. But refractors I find are the most versatile of all and they're also the most simplistic. There's very little maintenance that you're gonna have to do on your refractor. You probably won't even have to touch the collimation on a regular basis. I check mine maybe once a year and I can't remember the last time I even had to touch it for collimation. So if you're looking for ease of use, a refractor is gonna be hard to beat. Just remember that its limitations are going to be aperture. Uh, you're gonna be probably limited to about a 150 millimeter or smaller, unless you've got deep pockets and a big mount. So which refractor works best? Honestly, if I had to pick one for visual work, it's probably going to be an ED doublet. Get yourself a lightweight refractor. They're well corrected. They're not going to be uh, taxing your mount too much. And they're relatively affordable. Our Evo Star 150, or I'm sorry, our Evo Star series of refractors for their size are well corrected and they don't break the bank. And they're also really lightweight. The 120 Evo Star is like 14 pounds. You could put that on almost any mount that you want um, and it's solid and it's nearly a five inch refractor um, and it won't break the bank now a triplet refractor is going to be nice and if you can afford a triplet refractor that would be great but if you're strictly a visual observer i wouldn't really look into buying a triplet unless you really have astrophotography in mind for the long term the triplet is probably going to be superior when it comes to photographic color correction. So even photographically, you're going to be set up better going with a triplet than a doublet if astrophotography is in mind. But you're going to pay for that. If astrophotography is not of your interest or not even in the wheelhouse, then a nice ED doublet will do everything that you'll need it to do. Now, if you really just care about this being a visual instrument and you're only interested in deep sky, don't discount the Acromat refractors, especially the short tube refractors. Um, the Star Travel 120, and like I said, if you could find the Star Travel 150, this is a real quick question to you guys. Um, we've talked about internally, we've talked about bringing in the Star Travel 150. It's a six inch F5 Acromat refractor. If you're interested in one of those, this would be, and you're interested in having that here in the US and Canada, let us know in the chat. It would be kind of interesting if you guys would want to know about that. But the nice thing about these short tube Acromat refractors is they are fantastic deep sky telescopes. And as long as you keep the power low in a dark sky, they're phenomenal. Um, I use the six inch F5 refractor with my 28 as a companion telescope for wide field and you put an O3 or a UHC and you pan through the Milky Way and get all the nebulas, it's a really nice uh, design. Let's see, there's a question here. Can you get Skywatcher telescope cases with pluck foam so we can customize them? No, um, we don't make the pluck foam. Um, our cases are basically built for the refractor or the telescope that they are used for. However, if you want a case like that, I highly recommend SKB cases or Pelican is another one. And then there's a bunch of other knockoff ones, but SKB and Pelican are the two that come to mind. Now here's the reason I say this. Our cases, they're there to basically keep your telescope safe and they are going to get beat up the more and more you use it. And that happens. However, the nice thing about these cases from Pelican or SKB is those things are designed to last a long time. You can run over them with a truck. They're waterproof. They keep everything that's of value in your investment safe and locked away for when you're ready to use them. My eyepiece is sitting in SKB cases. 
my meteorite cases are SKBs. Um, I do like SKB more than Pelican because of the latches on the case. You just press in and pull up, or Pelican, you have to really fight their latches. And when your hands are cold, it hurts. So the little press and pull up tabs on the SKB cases I like quite a bit more. But if you want pluck foam, just go with Pelican or SKB. And I understand that their cases can be pricey. This is where I would say it's worth it. You spent a considerable amount of money on your equipment, whether it's a telescope tube or eyepieces or cameras or whatever it is. You spent a chunk of your money on those items. You want to protect your investment. And spending extra money on a good case is going to make sure that those accessories or telescope or whatever it is are protected for years to come. So don't skimp out on a cheap case. Make sure you're getting something good. Uh, and those SKB Pelicans or similar cases are really worth the investment. I understand they're expensive. They're a few hundred bucks. But when you're toting around a couple thousand dollars in cameras or filters or eyepieces, don't you want that to be safe and all in one spot? Invest in something nice. And then they come with pluck foam and you can customize it all you want. So, But Skywatcher, we don't have uh, pluck foam. Pluck foam is expensive. Um, and we have so many different things that it doesn't make sense for us to offer it currently, especially when you can get superior cases. Um elsewhere and get the pluck foam so that's my viewpoint on that uh, but yeah so if if you are looking for a refractor an all-in-one refractor i would recommend an ed doublet refractor it'll do everything that you want to do they're lightweight they don't need collimation they're not as expensive as a triplet and for visual they will do everything that you need and more um, if you have money burning a hole in your pocket and you just want the best Go get a triplet. A triplet is going to be great for everything you're going to do visually. They are going to be heavier because there's more glass. They are going to be more expensive because there's more glass. But they are also designed generally for astrophotography. So you want to keep that in mind um, and make sure that's all good to go for you. Um, but if you have no plans on doing imaging, I don't know that I would really recommend spending the money unless it meets a certain specification that you need. But honestly, a doublet is fine. Um, deep sky or wide field, really any design works. An affordable Acromat is a good way to go. Or if you just want to get into refractors, a decent Acromat refractor, there's nothing wrong with them. Just have the expectation that there's going to be color. Now, there are other telescopes out there like the Petzivals or the Quads. Um, a lot of times these telescopes are more particularly designed for imaging. Um, the reason why you generally have a quad or a Petzival refractor is because the flat field is built in. So generally you have optics in the back that are going to flatten the field of view and give you pinpoint stars out to the edge with no field curvature or distortion. These are normally better situated for astrophotography purposes. So a lot of times if you're buying a quad, it would be better to do that if you're seriously into astrophotography because the quad isn't going to give you much unless you are seriously into testing eyepieces. Because if you have a quad refractor or a Petzival, they're generally going to be well corrected and flat and you can test an eyepiece with that because you know any distortion that you're probably going to be seeing is going to come from the eyepiece side of things. Um, so if you're really into eyepieces and you're just into testing eyepieces, a quad or a Petzival of some kind, like the Teleview NP101 IS, fantastic refractor, or the FSQ106 from Takahashi, those are great telescopes. Um, but visually, they are both capable of doing visual work, but they are really designed for astrophotography purposes. So you're spending a lot more for something, if you're just doing visual, that you're not really utilizing the whole thing for. Um, and if you had to pick one, I'd probably pick the Teleview 101 um, or the Teleview 127 if you want the bigger one. If you want a Petzival that's better for visual. The Takahashi FSQs, 
are quite complicated and you need to get their rings and their diagonal in order to get it all to work visually. That telescope is way better designed for astrophotography. And if you're not using it for astrophotography, you're spending a lot of money on something you're probably not even getting 50% out of it at that point. There are other ones out there, I understand. Um, but anything that's a quad or a petzival is probably better suited and engineered for astrophotography. Uh, do your six inch refractors come with a case? All of our refractors come with a case. Um, from our 72 all the way up to our 150s, they all have custom cases for each size. So yes, the EvoStar 150DX, that comes in its a really long aluminum case. And then the Esprits all come in like a black style roadie case with uh, the larger two have wheels. Um, but yes, all the Skywatcher refractors come in a case. The only one that doesn't, or the only ones that don't, are the Star Travels, the Acromats, and the Evo Guide 50, um, which you could get a little case for the Evo Guide if you wanted to. Those are the only ones that don't. All the ED ones, all the Evo Star 72 and up, the Evo Lux 62 and 82, and all the Esprits come in their own custom case. So that's included with the price uh, when you get it. At least that is how it's here is here for the U.S. and Canada. I, I don't know about other regions um, at that point. Uh, my Evo Star 120 is fantastic visually uh, using the Evo... 85. Oh, good. I'm glad you're enjoying the Evo Star 120. The Evo Star 120 ED is probably one of our most popular refractors, and it only weighs 14 pounds. I mean, it floats away if you don't hold on to it, but it's nearly a five inch refractor at that point, too. Which, if I had to pick one telescope from our lineup and say, if I, if you needed one telescope that could do everything that you'd want to do from astrophotography to visual to solar and it's easy to use, the Evo Star 120 ED would be probably my pick weighs 14 pounds they're fairly cost effective they're extremely well color corrected and they're great for astrophotography as well i can't really say much more than that that's pretty much it so all right guys well that's pretty much it for today i hope that was helpful um so many of you out there in the future um, if you like what you see here please go ahead and subscribe leave a like on a video it lets us know we're doing a good job um, if you have ideas for a future episode, please email us at info at skywatcherusa.com and title it What's Up. Um, but that is pretty much it for picking a refractor for visual. Uh, next week, we are going to be doing a episode on the Starlux 190 Mac Newtonian. Uh, this is a very unique telescope in our lineup. It's the only Mac Newtonian in our lineup at the moment. I wish we'd do more. Um, but we're really going to talk about what this design and this telescope in particular brings to the table because the Mac Newtonian is essentially a perfect telescope. And I'm not just saying like ours is, but the design, Mac Newtonian as a design, is essentially perfect. Um, and it covers so many bases, but it's really an overlooked design. So we're going to be talking about that next week. That should be pretty cool. Um, if you're into imaging and you're looking for something that provides an APO-like experience without the APO price tag, this is the episode that you're going to want to learn about for the Mac Newtonian 190. Um, so we will be doing that next week. Uh, next week, our team will also be at Starfest. So come by, say hi to them there. Uh, looking forward to meeting all of you guys. It should be a good time. Also say hi to Trevor and Ashley from Astro Backyard. They'll be hanging out with our team as well. So look forward to seeing you guys out there. Uh, so that's pretty much it for picking a refractor for visual. I hope that was helpful. Um, please enjoy your weekend. Good luck on observing the Perseids this weekend. Be safe. Uh, bring lots of water. Um, and other than that, we will see you guys next week. Thank you very much. Check out skywatcher.threadless.com for any kind of swag that you might look for. Uh, Totem is still a thing. Uh, looking forward to seeing what you guys can get uh, for this month. Other than that, we will see you guys next Friday. Thank you very much, and clear skies. Take care. See ya. Bye.